presented uh, at the ALS Conference 2019, the Conference of the Australian Linguistic Society, in December 2019 at Macquarie University in Sydney by Maya Ponsonnet and Kirijin Lajinia. The title is My Belly is Angry and My Throat is in Love, a typology of body-based emotion metaphors in Australian languages. And I'm Maya Ponsonnet. Uh, what we're going to talk about here are body-based emotion tropes, so or metaphors as in the title, but trope is actually more accurate because technically this term includes metaphors, but as also metonymies, and so I will be talking about tropes. In any case, what we're talking about here are emotion expressions such as broken-hearted in English. So there's a literal meaning that relates to a body part, but the meaning really refers to an emotion. And Australian languages have quite a few of uh, such expressions, which is not unusual. In fact, it's frequent or perhaps universal across the world, but it is particularly prevalent in Australian languages. And in this talk, we present a first, the first study of this phenomenon across a sample of 67 languages across Australia, a balanced sample as far as possible, based on published and unpublished sources. We found that uh, body-based emotional tropes are attested in 53 languages which of these 67, which doesn't mean that they're absent in the others, but they're simply not attested. Um, and just in these languages, we found more than 800 emotional expressions involving a body part. I'm not going to be able to do justice to this data. In fact, some of the expressions would deserve an entire talk of themselves. Um, I'm working on a web page that will hopefully present more of these results, but in the meantime, this is an overview. And so what we found, uh, we found more than 30 body parts in total that um, are connected linguistically with emotions in our sample. And the stomach, or the belly, and I will talk about belly here, is by far the most frequent. It occurs in 26 languages out of the 67 uh, without any geographical restriction. And just on their own, these belly-based expressions account for 275 of the tokens in our data. Other frequent body parts are um, other abdominal organs as well as parts of the torso, um, parts of the head or face, as well as the throat. And I'm going to talk about these more frequent body parts in some details. There's also probably about around 20 others. It's a bit hard to say exactly how many because uh, sometimes ex identifying exactly what is a distinct body part is difficult. Imagine that in a language you may have a word translated as cheek and, the on, and on in the another language uh, a word is translated as side of the face. Um, how do you decide if it's one this, and the same thing or two different things? Anyway, um, yeah, there's probably about 20 other body parts where there's like maybe a handful of expressions, um, and so there's not really any pattern to talk about there. With this more frequent one, uh, as one would expect, the association with emotions is not random, and there are clusters, clusters of body parts which share uh, some of the properties, and based on this, they connect to emotions for different reasons. And this tends to correlate with their semantics, not, not neatly, but there are some correlations. And also there are some correlations with distribution of tropes, that is the sort of tropes that we find and, and how many um, with each body part. And I'm going to talk about, in this talk, we talk about how this works, what these clusters look like. First, I will present emergent scenarios, um, and then I'll talk about these clusters as such. Um, a caveat before I start is that, of course, this is given the semantic domains I'm looking at, this is interpretations plays a strong role, uh, both with respect to body parts and with respect to the labeling of emotions. But of course, um, interpretation doesn't mean random, so it, it doesn't have to be wrong. And basically what we're looking at are informed guess, guesses based on previous studies and, and accumulated knowledge, as well as some sort of uh, feedback or bottom-up deduction from the data. So emergent scenarios. So how do these things arise? How does a body part become associated linguistically with uh, an emotion? 
first, um, the history of each association, so each body part, but also in each language, is very intricate because there's um, historical death, often language contact comes into the picture, so it's complicated. And um, we are working on it with James Bednell and Isabel O'Keefe, but we don't really have hard and fast answers yet in as to the very finer detail of that. What I'm going to do here is highlight plausible emergence scenarios that are supported by our data. And basically, probably the main pathway of association between body parts and emotions in language are what I will call pragmatic bridges. This is where a body part associates with an emotion in, with an emotion in real life, and this in turn channels linguistic association. It's useful to distinguish several types of bridges, um, the first one being somatic. So this is where there's a physiological state that coincides with an emotional state. An example here, an example here belly stuck, uh, which can mean to feel anxious. And we know by experience that um, many of us would at least that anxiety can come with a fairly tight belly and that then channel the linguistic association. Another type is behavioral bridges, and this is the same principle, but with a behavior. Um, and for instance, you could have, you can have an expression that means to follow from the eyes, and that really means to covet. And of course, if you want something, you're likely to watch this thing. So it makes sense. And then there's the a third type of uh, pragmatic bridge, which is indirect uh, via intellection. And an example here from Walpuri is an expression that means ear stick out. Um, and it doesn't really mean this, this is just the literal meaning, but what it means is to keep thinking. And this is not surprising because many Australian languages treat the ears as the seat uh, of intellection. So that's the bridge, the pragmatic bridge with intellection. However, then, the, the, the sense keep thinking associates with emotions such as to obsess or to worry. And of course, we can understand here that these things often come together. If you think a lot, you may be worrying uh, and you are obsessing about something. All these um, pragmatic bridges tell us about what manifestations of emotions are salient for speakers. Because of course, well, one imagines that uh, in order for a particular connection to make its way into the language, it would need to be at least uh, salient enough for speakers. It, this could be universal or it could be culturally specific. And yeah, either way. But there's another type of uh, em pathway, emergent scenario, where, which is via semantic shift, which is very different. Um, so here, Let's consider that the meaning of body part words is very versatile. So we know that body part words can uh, change meaning very fast. And let's take an example with Skydage in Central Australia, where the root alame primarily means belly and occurs in emotion metaphors. We have here an expression that means stomach speak or rambling, and uh, it means to feel worried, anxious or jealous. So that's another of these digestive metaphor metaphors. Um, and if we look at a neighboring language, Ayawara, it has the same root, but instead of meaning belly primarily, it actually means liver primarily. So there's a, a shift in the meaning. And Ayawara also has uh, body-based expressions with the liver. For instance, liver get hot to get angry. Here, based on the, the rest of the data, the best hypothesis is that the association occurred when the word meant belly. Um, so that in fact, probably, or at least not, perhaps not this particular expression, but the, some of these expressions would have been in Ayawara with the belly, but then because the meaning shifted to liver, this created an association between emotions and the liver. And then from there, of course, speakers can elaborate more uh, expressions with the liver that refer to emotions. This does not tell us anything about how emotions are perceived uh, when the, the association uh, is initiated, because it's basically a sort of linguistic accident. However, it could influence in turn uh, the perceptions of emotions and speakers could come to see emotions are as, as something having to do with the liver because it's in the language. 
So to summarize, we have uh, pragmatic bridges, which can be somatic, behavioral, or indirect via intellection. Um, and then there's a different type of mechanism, which, which is association by a semantic shift. And from there, further tropes developed, developed based on conceptual elaboration. So speakers can, you know, be creative and, and make more expressions and scenarios can combine. You can have, you know, somatic bridges and behavioral bridges with the same body part, etc. However, there are some trends and some profiles and this is what I'm going to talk about now with respect to the figurative clusters, which basically correspond to each of the bridging possibilities, so somatic, uh, semantic shift, behavioral and via intellection. So body parts with somatic bridges. These are invisible internal body parts, and it makes sense because they are the ones that are involved in somatic responses to emotions. So basically two abdominal organs, the belly and the heart, as well as the throat. And semantically, well, semantically, the belly, for instance, is very general because it has so many expressions, but uh, it does have a bit of a focus on generic emotions. So just feel good or, or bad, like sort of neutral emotions, as well as emotions oriented towards others. Um, anger, love, compassion, grief, so things you feel for others. And we've seen that in terms of bridges, we have digestive tropes. Um, and this is well attested in the data. With the heart, on the other hand, um, the semantic focus is a bit more limited. So the heart-based heart expressions target love and fear on the one hand. So love as in affection, um, yeah, quite generally, but for, for close people like family, etc., or, or potentially also your uh, spouse. Um, and anger as well. And in terms of bridging tropes, we find heartbeat tropes. So expressions for heartbeat, which connect to fear, anxiety, worry, etc. So that's the second um, strong uh, profile. And then the, the throat. So semantically, the throat is even more focused than the, the belly, the, yeah, certainly than the belly, but than the heart. And there's two major uh, types of emotions in the set. One is desire and love, but not love as with the heart, but really sexualized love. So it's really about sexual desire, sexual attraction and want. And this is dominant in Central Australia, whereas in Western Australia, the very clearly dominant uh, emotion is anger for the throat. And this is quite uh, well, uh, well, not entirely, but it, it's the split is quite clear. And generally speaking, the throat is, is, has a fairly different pattern from other uh, body parts. So it's more limited uh, regionally. So it's clearly focused in some central Australia. There's not many examples in the northern parts of the continent. It's also um, much more dense in uh, central Australia. And the semantics, like I, the semantics, like I said, is very crisp. So and in terms of uh, bridging context, we have dryness tropes, dry throat, burning throat, etc. And um, and this could have to do with the arid climate. I mean, why not? Um, and it would make sense that this is partly determined by the environment, because if you compare with the belly and the heart, for instance, cross linguistically, the throat is by no mean, means as frequent uh, a, a connotation of emotions as these two body parts, the belly and the heart. Um, yeah, I just wanted to specify here that I, I'm, the tropes I'm mentioning, the expressions I'm mentioning are just the bridges. And of course, there are many, many more expressions for each of these body parts. In terms of the distribution of trope, there is an interesting phenomenon here. So what we're looking at in, in this table here um, is a uh, uh, a split in terms of types of tropes. So there's different types of metonymies and different types of metaphors, and the percentages indicate uh, the proportion of each trope for each set. So the belly has 275 expressions and in our data, tokens in our data, and 16% are generic metonymies, etc. Um, and it doesn't add up to 100 because there are certain things that we cannot really uh, place because we don't have enough information, etc. 
And what we see here is that the belly and the heart align very neatly in the, their uh, percentages uh, and in the distribution of their tropes, uh, in spite of having slightly different semantics. Whereas the throat, on the other hand, is very different. And in fact, it's not just different from these two. It's, it's very different from all the other body parts. Um, in particular, it has very few metaphors, uh, practically known, in fact, in our data. Um, and that's quite unusual. The second type or cluster um, is body parts where there's good reasons to think that semantic shift played a strong role. Uh, and these are one other abdominal organ, which is the liver, as well as two parts of the torso, the abdomen and the chest. We've already seen that um, there's the, the belly to liver uh, semantic extensions are attested in Central Australia. They are also in the Cape York. Um, and in terms of semantics, interestingly, the liver set compares with the belly set. And it seems to be a bit of a, a subset, if you like, which supports the, hypo the hypothesis that many liver-based expressions used to be or originated in belly-based expressions. Not all, probably, but many. Uh, of course, in terms of the distribution of tropes, there's no bridges at all, um, which also is consistent with the idea that the main association is via semantic shift. And the trope distribution compares with the belly, although there are some differences, but they are also um, uh, consistent with an extension from the belly scenario. The other two body parts where semantic shift probably plays a strong role are parts of the torso. And here as well, we know that extensions from uh, a smaller body part to a larger uh, hole uh, are common. And so, and we do have attestation of uh, belly to abdomen or heart to chest or, or either way uh, in our data. And again, semantically, um, each of these body parts seems to combine the semantics of the belly and the heart. So it's probable that a lot of these expressions originated in the belly, in belly-based or heart-based expressions. And there's no somatic bridge for the abdomen. There are some bridges, marginal bridges for the chest. Um, and the distribution also compares with the belly and heart, but it's more dispersed. And basically, if we look at these three, liver, abdomen, chest, they sort of look a bit like each other, and they also look like the belly and heart, but compared to these two, they're, they're more dispersed. So it also makes sense to that it would be a derivation from belly or heart. The third cluster is that of body parts with behavioral bridges. And these are parts of the face, which also makes sense because parts of the face are visible, not only visible, but they're also visually salient in social interactions, which is a good ground for behavioral bridges. And these are the eyes, the nose, and the face. I'm not gonna talk about the face very much because uh, in Australian languages, it's practically always collexified with eyes, nose, or forehead sometimes. And as a result, it's hard to extract a pattern for the face. In terms of semantics, um, the eyes connect with desire, jealousy, or love. And this is a bit in between the, the heart, which is more like affection, and the throat, which is clearly sexual. This is more like s sexually... Uh, uh, call it uh, romantic attraction, if you like. And we saw that there's a bridge with fuller from the eyes. Another meaning is uh, fear. And there's also, there are some bridging contexts with uh, staring. So uh, you can stare at something that you're not afraid of, for instance. With surprise, um, which is a third strong uh, block, um, semantic block in, with the eyes, there's a lot of um, big eye for surprise. And so that can also connect to fear. With the nose, the uh, bridges are with turning your nose up or sideways, which, and here the nose could also be the face. And this is for dislike something. And that leads to a lot of um, social attitudes or social disposition that have to do with social distance. So being angry, being sulky, selfish, stubborn, greedy, etc. And they're, so they're very social, uh, and they're also practically all negative, is the noise. And there's also fairly good uh, sort of convergence between the eyes and nose in terms of the tropes they instantiate. And 
the pattern, the trend is that they have more metonymies than metaphors compared to uh, to the belly, which can be a point of, a point of reference. Um, and they have, of course, as a re which you know is a correlate. They have more metonymies, and these metonymies are both behavioral, but actually also somatic. And the fourth uh, cluster is intellectual body parts. So we saw that they connect to emotions via intellections. Intellection, sorry. In uh, in Australia, the the ear is uh, often treated as a seat of intellection, but the head and forehead also are, as as is cross linguistically common. So all these um, connect uh, to emotions via intellection. In many Australian languages, intellect, intelligence correlates with social awareness and appropriateness, and this is to be this seems to be the main pathway of connection with emotions, and that results in many social and attitudinal emotions. So, compliance, agreeableness, again, stubborn, uh, and generous, etc. Um, the head has shame. There's a strong correlation between head and uh, shame, association between head and shame, and certainly the shame is shame is very. Uh, in this particularly, in this partly culturally specific notion of shame is linked to social awareness. Um, and this goes via things like uh, to be earless, which can be to be deaf, but also unintelligent and therefore disagreeable. And with the, the head and the forehead, there's a lot of hard head or hard forehead um, metaphors, which lead, which go to being obstinate, arrogant, selfish, greedy. So that's also about um, yeah, social dispositions. So interestingly, the head and the forehead are mostly negative. They're mostly social and mostly negative. And in this way, they are, in this respect, they are like the nose. Whereas the ear is more diverse and also connects with specifically, with more specific intellectual processes, such as obsession, we've talked about it, uh, confusion, um, that sort of things. And we've seen this example of uh, to keep thinking for worrying about. And in fact, this correlation between uh, thinking a lot and worrying or being obsessed is quite common across the continent. Um, in terms of distribution of tropes, uh, the, this is a bit less neat than with the other clusters. So the ear seems to have its own pattern, maybe a bit like the throat. Um, the head and forehead show some resemblances, but actually also with the nose, there are some strong resemblances with the, between the forehead and the nose. And also they have similar semantics because these three body parts are all uh, very socially oriented, attitudinal emotions, uh, dispositions, etc., social dispositions, and also uh, predominantly negative. To wrap up, uh, this is a summary of our uh, four clusters. There's invisible body parts with somatic bridges, which denote core emotions um, that are not attitudes, not uh, social attitudes, although they are often related to others. With the tropes, the belly and the heart pattern very strongly together, whereas the throat has its own type. Then there's the other organs and parts of the torso where we can hypothesize that semantic shift played a strong role and in many respects, these seem to derive from the belly and the heart. Um, a third uh, cluster is parts of the face, which are visually salient and then and therefore have a lot of behavioral bridges. They're mostly related to social and attitudinal, although not only. And in terms of tropes, they have more metonymies and less metaphors. And then there's parts of the head where the bridge is, uh, the, the bridge is via intellection. And in terms of uh, emotions, it's mostly social and attitudinal, and the tropes are, are less coherent, which in a sense may be expected given that there's this, um, it's the connection with the body part is indirect and goes via intellection. And of course, with all this uh, observation, the big question is, is this universal or is this specific to Australia? And for this, what we need is uh, basically more uh, studies that look at other continents, other language families to assess whether what is culturally specific and what is universal.